Hello, this is Aaron, and welcome back to the show. I'm very excited to have special guest today, Tim <laughs> Bailey. Tim is the past senior pastor of Trinity Reformed Church in Bloomington, Indiana. He's the author of several books, Church Reform, Daddy Tried, Grace of Shame, many others. And uh, apropos of this conversation, he was also the founding executive director of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. So thank you very much for, for joining and taking the time to talk today. I appreciate it's it. It's good to be with you again, Aaron. You know, I uh, when I was living in New York, one summer we came back and spent uh, a month in Bloomington, and so I was able to go to your church uh, several weeks there. And it really is a great church. I mean, the uh, very warm uh, greetings, great community, a hundred kids under the age of five or something like that. 200. And, yeah, so it's, 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 it's crazy <laughs> what's going on there. A, a really great, a, a really great church. And, you know, I think that most people who, who kind of know you, it's sort of, it's a little bit like uh, maybe like Doug Wilson. It's like, he's, you know, you guys are known for your online writings, your, your, your blog. That's how most people mm -hmm. know you, but you know, you're not just the online blogger, you know, opinion guy, you're, you're really are a pastor. And I think your mm -hmm. heart really is for the, the sheep in the congregation. Mm -hmm. So when we were there, we're just visiting. You barely know me. You're like, we have a young son who's about to turn one. You're like, hey, if you have some time, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy. I'd be open to spend, you know, an hour and just, you know, kind of talk about like child Christian child rearing and you know mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I'm like, great, yeah, I'd love to do it. And you have a lot of great stuff. I mean, it's such a good example. You're not just about the content. You actually care about the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like that's very important, uh, very important. And so, uh, if you ever get a chance to visit Trinity uh, Reformed Church down in Bloomington. Uh, you know, you should do it. It's great. And the other thing before we get started that I, I wanted to, to highlight was, uh, you know, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, I made the pitch to people to uh, contribute to a uh, fund drive that your Warhorn Media Unit was doing to put man and woman in Christ back into print. And I'm very happy to see that we actually have the book. You can see this is a substantial book. It's a great hardcover edition. So thanks to everyone who contributed Absolutely. to that. And so right now, if you if you didn't already get in on it, you can go to Amazon, you can buy it in hardcover, you can buy it in Kindle, and there's actually a free web version online. You have to pay anything. Just go, you can go to the website. I'm actually gonna uh, send out a link into Masculinist to make sure everybody has that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, you, 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 you put the pitch, hey, contribute money to get this thing, and it's delivered and delivered in a very high quality way. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you for bringing it. Again, this is the most important book, kind of modern book on gender and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I found out about it from you. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I think it was you who, who mentioned it to me. It may have been David Talcott, but um, who heard about it from you, I'm sure. And uh, it, it was really good. So uh, I appreciate it. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here and I have my grandchildren wanting to come into ah. the... That's good. To the house. Wait a second. Hold on. No, no problem. You can come in, but be real quiet, okay? Speaking of my concern being people. There you go. You know, I remember that. Um, that remember that famous clip from that guy on the BBC? He streamed in. Yeah, kids. I loved it. Well, now that's everybody. I mean, now now that we've gone to COVID, yeah. everybody's remote. Like this is normal. You know, people are taking meetings with like their kids sitting in their lap yeah. and stuff like that. So it's kind of great. Is is, is to to because that's, that's the real life. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, you know, I wanted to start our conversation by talking a little bit about you and your background, because you have a very interesting background. It's kind of a how I got how we got to now story here. And you know, your parents were actually pretty prominent people in the evangelical world. So who were your parents? My dad was Joe Bailey and my mother was Mary Lou Bailey. They were at Wheaton as students back in the days of all the major guiding lights of evangelicalism in the 20th century. Uh, dad had come from New York City. He lived in Flushing um, on Parsons Boulevard. And when they left Wheaton, they got married. Dad studied at Faith Seminary, which was sort of similar to Westminster coming out of the fundamentalist controversy. And then 
Dad and Mud, we call my mother Mud, M-U-D, that's our affectionate term for her. Dad and Mud were the first university staff workers for all of New England. They had the entire New England. They lived on Mass Avenue in Cambridge. Um, then a number of years later, Dad and Mud moved down to Philadelphia, helped start Delaware County Christian School there. Um, giving you an indication of the kind of family I came from, my father and mother, back in the 50s, when they started that school, the early 50s, they made, my dad was on the board, they were the founding members, and dad made the board accept a rule that black students would be accepted in the school. Mm -hmm. And this is many years before the civil rights movement. And that's the kind of parents I grew up with. Um, my father was very sophisticated. Uh, I once had Alan Emery, the scion of the wool merchants of New England, guy that lives on top of a hill in a you know uh, in an you know three century old house, tell me that when Dad came to Wheaton, it made him uh, feel that he was a country hick, mm. <laughs> and that was my dad. Um, so my background is uh, growing up with a very sophisticated father, an editor, publisher, writer, speaker, who never towed the party line of evangelicalism. And I think that's important to say because some of the things we're gonna talk about today, people are gonna think, oh my goodness, can't you just shut up and go along with the majority of people? And I just have to say it's in my DNA. I just mm -hmm. don't, I don't trust the church is majority to honor God. I think we have to be led. And I think that's what Moses' story shows us. So that's sort of my background. Now, I should go on and say that um, Mary Lee comes from, uh, she's the ninth of 10 children. I'm, I'm one of seven. So that's your wife, right? Mary Lee. Yeah. Mary wife. Lee is my wife. We have 29 grandchildren who are running around at the different houses here. We're on vacation right now. Um, Mary Lee came from a family where her father and my father had both been editors of InterVarsity's magazine called His. They'd both gone to Wheaton. Their wives had both gone to Wheaton. We were extremely unusual at that time because neither of our families had televisions. And I mean, mm -hmm. that was outlying to the max. Um, and Mary Lee grew up uh, with her father uh, paraphrasing the Living Bible. So her dad is Ken Taylor. So our family and their family were naturally close. They both worked with university. Both of them were running publishing companies. Dad had started Tyndale House Publishers. Uh, both of us had no television. Both of us read voraciously. Um, both of our fathers were a very unique type in that neither of them were the sort of loudmouth, obnoxious, look at me, look at me leaders that we have all across the Reformed evangelical community today. Both of those men were humble and meek. Both of them were humble and meek. Um, and both of them gave their money away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dad Taylor had the best, some of the best selling books in the world. And he just gave the money away. He gave so much of it away that it bankrupted Tyndale. They didn't end up having to go into bankruptcy. But literally, it just, it, it, he, he, he gave away the goose that laid the golden egg. And for years afterwards, they had to try to bring solvency back to Tyndale House. So these men were categorically different than the celebrity Christians that I find so disgusting today. Mm. I'm so sorry. Your, uh, so yeah. your, um, your father-in-law, I mean, you just, his sister brings up, he's the guy, so he's the guy who basically wrote the New Living Translation. Yeah, he did the today. paraphrase, yeah. but he's also the guy that agreed to publish Dare to Discipline by Dobson when I think 15 publishers had refused. He's also the guy that gave Dobson money to start a radio program. He's also the, I mean, I could go on and on and on to the things. He started the short-term missions movement. He and, and, and he did this without even keeping track of it. He mm -hmm. just didn't even keep track. He was such a, a humble man. And he just gave his money away willy-nilly every year at Christmas. 
we would get gifts from the resale shop from his wife every single Christmas. Mm. And we'd all joke about the fact that, well, mom, did you get this is twice as nice? You know, she worked as a volunteer there, you mm. know? So it's such a relief for me to have had that background. However, I will say this, when Mary Lee and I started dating, she was what, 14 and I was 16. We went to the same church, College Church in Wheaton. And, you know, this was the late 60s, my sister, went on the March on Washington, played around with the SDS, Students for Democratic Society. My dad was had a beard back then, which only beatniks had. Um, and so Mary and I imbibed of the milk of the culture, and both of us uh, became feminists. Mm -hmm. And I mean real feminists. Um, and so you might wonder why did that happen given the godliness of your parents? And I would say that all marriages are hard. And there were things about her parents and mine which had really been difficult uh, for the children at times. I don't think there's any child who grows up in a healthy marriage where there aren't difficulties that he sees. But we were the 60s kids mm -hmm. and we sucked it in. And we became convinced that we knew better than our parents and we would be persons instead of men and women. Mm. And so that's a good intro maybe to yeah. our subject. Yeah. So though you probably don't like to be bracketed with him, perhaps, you know, sort of like Al Mohler starting off as a feminist, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were kind of that way. And, you know, I think your background is really important for people because, you know, when you do see someone such as yourself, who's kind of known as a dissident, uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I get the impression with these people that what happened was they really wanted to be in the club and they, they weren't admitted to the club and now they're, they're really got a chip on their shoulder about it. Like I, that's how I feel about Donald Trump. When I see Donald Trump, I'm like, here's somebody who wanted to be admitted to high society in New York. They didn't want him. So he sort of leaned in to being the boorish outsider. But you're very different in that you were like a blue blood you know, Christian royalty. And I used to be handsome. Yeah. You were, you, you were inner party. You were inner party. And we'll get to that in a minute. Like, you know, you don't become like the executive director of an institution like C BMW, uh, unless you're like kind of part of it. So you started off, like you were inner party. You were coming from a position where you didn't have to worry about being accepted in the club or getting the cool kids to like, cause you just, you grew up knowing all, knowing all these people. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so you, you were kind of, you're coming from a very different place maybe than many other people are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it is interesting that you became with you and your wife were kind of, um, were you really into the counterculture per se, or just, you, know, you mentioned the SDS and that, or were you, you know, were you, were you, were you, were you Harry, and I were in, yeah, yeah. I had real long hair. I looked like the who's Roger Daltrey. I mean, <laughs> looked identical to him. Hmm. I didn't buy dope, but I hitchhiked all over the country many times and you got in cars, they were smoking dope or opium. And so you smoked with them. Hmm. So I did drugs. I, I never got hooked on anything but marijuana, but I did get hooked on marijuana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was hard to stop smoking mm -hmm. dope. Wow. Um, Mary Lee, similar. She went to Westmont. And uh, she started the first women's center there. Um, so that's our background. Uh, it's important that people know that we were all so sinful sexually. And so at the end of our seven years of dating, Mary Lee uh, did get pregnant. Um, and the question was whether or not, um, well, I won't go into all the details except to say, Obviously, there were alternatives that could have salvaged the family names. And we just absolutely would not do that. Um, we did not believe uh, that it would honor God for us. Although Mary Lee didn't want to get married. She wanted us to go ahead and start living together. And she wanted us to ride down 101 on the West Coast on bicycles without benefit of marriage and have our baby and this that, and the other thing, you know. And I had to say to her, no, lover, we're going to get married. So we did get married inside the living room of the Taylor's home. It, there were many tears. It was all clearly repentance for our sexual mm -hmm. sin. 
And then we moved to Madison because, of course, Madison was the closest I could get to Berkeley in the Midwest. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you're kind of there, and you ultimately you become a Presbyterian minister. So, how did yeah. you how did you end up get, for going from there into kind of deciding to go into the ministry? I had always intended to go into the ministry. Mary Lee did a podcast recently on the podcast show called Monumental, where she tells the story herself, which she had never done before, and she did not clean it up. It's quite funny. Um, that's at warhornmedia.com. Um, Mary, Lee, um, Mary Lee and I moved to Madison, and um, we were both feminists. We were married, but we were both feminists. And we, you do what you do when you don't have any authority in a relationship, which is that you fight. And so nothing was a given. No job was a given because I was a man, she was a woman. No leadership, not even the speed that we would walk out. I tell people that at that time, she was shorter than I was, and we would not give in to each other and how fast we walked. Mm -hmm. And, and, it was just awful. And then one day, a dear brother who ran an organic goat farm up in Wisconsin. <laughs> okay, you're with me? Yeah. He takes me aside when we go up to visit him and he says, Tim, God wants you to lead your home. And it was cataclysmic for me. And when he said that to me, what I realized was that I was a rebel. You know, I had a pierced steer. I'd gotten a pierced steer in 73 when I worked for the Wittenberg door, used specialties. Mary Lee had worked piercing people at the cannery in San Francisco. And she had a pierced nose. Nobody had pierced ears who was a woman. Nobody had, or pierced ears who was a man. Nobody had pierced noses who were women. So that was who we were. But God began to work with us, especially by me starting to think about authority, I just realized in every area of my life, I was a rebel. That's why I moved to Madison. And uh, so that started a long, long, and it continues to this day, period of repentance. When I graduated from UW-Madison in history, Reformation history, got to study under Stephen Kingdom. Some people will know uh, that name. We moved to Boulder, Colorado, where I worked at First Pres there on the pastoral staff for a year. Then we went to Gordon-Conwell. I was there for three years, got my MDiv, and First Pres in Boulder sponsored us. We came under care there. And I to uh, ask, now, Gordon, were you at Gordon-Conwell the same time as Tim Keller? No, I wasn't. It, they um, had to have been roughly the same era. Yeah, we might have overlapped one year, but I think <laughs> he is about three or four years older than I am, or okay. he was there. I was there with a number of the guys that converted to Roman Catholicism, and my friend uh, Scott uh, Hahn and his wife Kimberly are probably the best known of those who converted to Roman Catholicism during that time. Scott Hahn was a rabid theonomist. Mm. A student there. And then shortly after he graduated, he became Roman Catholic. Mm. Okay. And Marcus Grodi was there. Some people who are Roman Catholic will know him um, from EWTN. He has a fatherhood show there. Um, so anyhow, no, I was not there with Tim Keller. I never knew Tim Keller until I began to send people to his church from Bloomington when they graduated from IU. And that was my introduction to Tim mm -hmm. Keller. So you were telling me, so I interrupted your story. You went back, you went back to Boulder. I can't, what church you were taken under care at? Well, no, they took me under care, which is a Presbyterian process of acknowledging this man has gifts. So they, at the end of the year of me working there, they said, you have gifts for ministry. We believe in you. We want you to go to seminary. We want you to come under care. I went under care of Boulder Presbytery. And when I came out of seminary, I, I want to say this, the track to the position that Tim Keller held for many years and many of the big names in evangelicalism. That track is that you get a position at a place like First Pres in Boulder, um, College Church in Wheaton, 10th Pres in Philadelphia, um, Park Street in Boston. And I would have had no problems getting those positions because mm -hmm. of who my father and father-in-law were. Mm -hmm. um, but 
and I, this is a little bit bragging. I'm sorry about that, but it's absolutely essential that people understand this. When I graduated, I did not apply to any of those places. Consciously decided that I was going to apply for inner city churches in Chicago that were poor, for eastern Kentucky churches in Appalachia in Letcher County, and one church in Montana in a town called Coal Strip, which should give you an idea of what the town was, and a town called Partyville out in rural Wisconsin. It was a decision, and people might say, well, why wouldn't you just go to a suburban church and ride the wave? And, and, and okay, because I already did not like evangelicalism. Mm. I felt that it was a proud, rich, snob society, at that time, Bill Hybels was coming into absolute hegemony over everything. A day didn't go by that I didn't get crud from him in my mailbox. Mm -hmm. And I could not stand Willow Creek. I could not stand Bill Hybels. I could not stand Bill Gothard. My father had confronted Bill Gothard about immorality in his headquarters back in his monthly call in eternity in the 70s, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to have anything to do. And so the church I got hired by, they didn't know who my dad was. Mm -hmm. They had no idea who Ken Taylor was. There was mm -hmm. one woman who knew what the Living Bible was, you know. Mm -hmm. But they didn't give a rip about us coming from Wheaton, who our parents were, who our parents were, friends were. You know, they didn't give a rip about any of that. And they had had women elders for decades. <laughs> Yeah, so this was in the this was in the PCUSA. So this was a northern, but it was the predecessor. So it was the Northern Presbyterian Church. Yeah. Right. Was this the church in Wisconsin? Is that where it yes, was? So you yeah. Get the church yeah. in Wisconsin. Yeah. It's you know it, it's kind of a. Feminist it was a yoke yeah. parish, and it was two parishes eight miles apart: a country church, a city church, a town church of fifteen hundred, and uh, so that's where it was. It's about an hour north of uh, of Madison. And. When you went there, did you have the idea that you were sort of moving away from feminism or did that happen after you arrived? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So at this point, the way Mary Lee would tell the story and the way I tell it differs. Okay. okay. When I was in Boulder, they had women elders and they had some good women elders. Godly. We were very close to one of them. Um, when I went to Gordon Conwell, though, I was opposed to women's ordination, absolutely opposed to it. But Gordon Conwell at that time was a, uh, it was absolutely feminist, absolutely feminist. Roger Nicole was feminist. You know, Gordon Fee was feminist. They even, the year after I left, sent out an email to everybody on campus saying, do not hurt the feelings of people who are in favor of women's ordination by what you say and the questions you ask in classes. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just that it was feminist. It was a closed union lock shop feminism mm -hmm. where you could not argue against it without becoming persona non grata. So that a few years later, when Bloom came out with The Close of the American Mind, I read that book. And I said, not, oh, that's what I experienced getting my bachelor's at UW-Madison. Oh, no, no, no. I said, that is what I experienced at Gordon-Conwell. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was intensely feminist. And so with Roger and Nicole, I took all my theology with Nicole. And I, I went up to him after one class and I said, Dr. Nicole, I have never heard you use an argument from experience until just now where you're defending women's ordination, you know? While I was there drowning in the egalitarian feminism hegemony of that school, a book was issued by a group that I was uh, very much uh, committed to. It was called uh, Servant Books. It was called Pastoral New Newsletter. It was called Word of God. It's the same community, really, that our most recent nominee to the Supreme Court comes out of up at Notre Dame. Okay, Amy? And... I saw that one of the main leaders of this group called Stephen B. Clark had come out with a book on man as male and female, man and woman in Christ, okay? And, or no, is it, 
Yes, yes, in Christ. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And so I went to the library and I said, do you guys have a copy? They said, yes. And I said, well, where is it? And they said, well, it's checked out. So I kept going back day after day, week after week, and I couldn't get a copy of it. I finally went to the library and I said, could you tell me who has this book? I want to read it. You know, I was poor, very poor. And they said, oh, David Scholler, Professor Scholler has it. Well, Scholler was every bit as rabid a feminist as Gordon Fee was. Mm -hmm. Nicole wasn't quite as bad. Okay. At that time, Nicole said, the man is the head of the home and marriage. But everywhere else, it was egalitarianism. He later even said, man is not the head of his wife, which is sad. Anyhow, so I wrote Dr. Uh, Scholler and I said, Dr. Scholler, would it be okay if I got, uh, if I could have a copy, if I could get your copy of that book? I'm waiting to read it. And of course, a little embarrassing because he knew that I was against women's ordination. I was asking to read the book. That's where I read the book. Mm -hmm. And it was life changing for me, not in terms of my commitments, but in terms of my seeing that as the feminists who are honest have always said, the Bible is hopelessly patriarchal. <laughs> right. And so you may think, oh no, well then what on earth were you doing going into the denomination that ordained women pastors and elders? And my response is, this is where Mary Lee and I diverge. I would say that I wanted the security of that denomination where I had worked in Boulder, of all the people I knew, my father went and spoke at PCUSA conferences and churches, Highland mm -hmm. Park, down in Dallas. He'd go out to the Hunt's uh, ranch, you know, when he was speaking down there, I had a conversation with him see, sitting at Nelson Bunker Hunt's desk mm -hmm. one night mm -hmm. while I was at seminary. And it was a secure, you know, I didn't want to go into evangelicalism because to me it was just a bunch of stuffed shirts. But the PCUSA was historic. It's the church my dad had grown up in. I at least felt that my family heritage, and I have ancestors going back into the early 1700s, late 1600s, in the Lancaster County area, all my ancestors are buried at Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. And so to me, it had integrity because it was. But I will tell you, there is no question in my mind that I was sinful, okay? Mm -hmm. I was sinful. I did not trust God the way I should have with my ecclesiastical affiliation, okay? Mm -hmm. And Mary Lee says, yeah, but look at how God used it. And I always get facial tics, and, mm -hmm. you know? Well, yeah, he did, you know? One of the ways he used it is every morning when I'd get up and take a shower, I'd be in the shower thinking, you compromiser, you have no good conscience. You shouldn't be in this denomination. You know very well. So let me keep going and tell you a little story. Mm -hmm. So I've been there about a year and a half, and I preach the Bible. I love the Bible. I trust its authority. Well, this was pretty radical for these two churches, you know. They had sort of the chilled out evangelical sort of liberal version of Christianity. Here comes this wide-eyed real believer, you know, preaching mm -hmm. the Bible, you know. Well, there was a man out in the country church who was the best farmer in the, in the neighborhood. Everybody knew he was, but he was sporadic in his church attendance, and his wife was an elder. One day, we get an invitation to go out to his house for lunch. They call it dinner, okay? Mm -hmm. Supper is dinner. Dinner is mm -hmm. supper for them. And so we go out. We have lunch. It's wonderful. Evelyn and Don Jarrett, I dedicate the book on elders to him and Joel Belts. And we get done eating, and his wife looks at him and he says, Dad, she says, Dad, that's what she called him in front of us. Dad, didn't you have something you wanted to ask the reverend? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, no, here we go. And he says, yeah, he says, I, I wanted to know whether you believe women should be pastors and elders. Well, you know, that was the dirty little secret. Mm -hmm. Well, being the coward I was, I said, well, actually, no, I don't think they should. Well, and I hemmed and hawed and said, I think men are the head of the home, but it's not as clear in the church. Now, I will tell you, that was a lie. Mm -hmm. That was just a lie. It misrepresented my 
position, let alone scripture. And so I talked to them and, and tried to sort of, and he said to me, he said, how, how am I supposed to submit to my wife at church as an elder and then come home and she's supposed to be under me as the man at home? And I said, well, well that's you know. a good question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, you know, in the early church, sometimes the slave was the bishop over his master, you know. It's just wonderful. Don't you like that, Aaron? Mm -hmm. That's just so helpful, you know. And then I and then I began to wonder whether maybe he was an abuser, whether maybe he, you know, didn't was insecure. <laughs> Actually, I remember that thought. Well, here we have an insecure man that doesn't think he can be under a woman at church because he's the big man at home. You know, I actually mm -hmm. thought that. So we go and leave. I think I've escaped with my reputation somewhat intact. He begins to come to church more regularly. About two months later, they invite us over for lunch again. At the end of the lunch, she turns to her husband again and says, Dad, didn't you have a question you wanted to ask Pastor Bailey? I think in the interim, I went from Reverend to Pastor Bailey, okay? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes, he says, I, I would like to know what you would think about uh, Evelyn resigning as an elder. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. Well, the PCUSA requires women to serve as elders and pastors in proportion to their membership in the church and the denomination. This is constitutionally required. Right. You don't have any choice, okay? And so I'm sitting there thinking, oh man, if she resigns, I'm gonna have to have a woman elder and I have a pretty good idea who that woman elder is gonna be if she resigns. And so I spent the lunch pleading with them, please do not resign. If you resign, I'm gonna have to get a worse woman and you're godly, and you're an excellent elder, aside from the fact that you're a woman, you're wonderful, you know. She came to a session meeting about a month later, and at the very end of it, she waited, and she said, by the way, this will be my last session meeting, I'm resigning, and I'm going, oh no, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so, sure enough, the woman that was elected in her place was a woman in her 80s, I gave her a right, to the first session meeting at the end, I took her home. We had a good relationship, but as I stopped in her driveway to let her out, she turned to me and she said, Timothy, I want you to know that you and I are going to have problems. You believe that the Bible is the word of God, and I believe that the Bible is the words of men. Hmm. And that's who replaced Evelyn. Well, you can imagine that I got more and more um, tormented, you know, every morning. And I finally went out with my wife, to Evelyn and Don. Oh, I didn't tell you. He ended up, for the first time ever, they had asked him again and again for the first time ever, he agreed to become an elder of that church. He then became the clerk of session. He then sent his son to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, another son to Grace College of the Bible, and the third son is now a pastor supervisor Baptist uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, in other words, that man led the revival of that church. It had had a revival before, and so my conscience was burning. I went out there with my wife one night. I said, Don, I can't keep being the pastor of this church. I just feel that I have betrayed the Lord and his word. And oh, by then, the women in that church were no longer willing to serve as elders. So if they were ever nominated, and so the presbytery sent a disciplinary committee to our church to lash us with noodles for not having women elders. And all the women said, well, they nominate us, but we don't want to do it because now our husbands are willing and that's what we actually always mm -hmm. wanted. You know? <laughs> and so I was on presbytery council, the top governing body of the denomination in our area. Um, and Don said to me, he said, you know, Tim, I think what you should do is you should just trust the elders with your future and just trust God. Well, a little while later, the state said that they were going to take a lot of our parking space for right of way for the state highway in front of the church. And we were landlocked with a graveyard. And Don let 
the church no, he would not give money to rebuild in that denomination because they confiscated anything that you owned. Mm -hmm. And so through that process, we had meetings for about a year and a half, both elders boards from both churches, and we decided to leave the denomination. We ended up going into the PCA. And in the PCA, when I was examined on the floor of Presbytery to transfer in with the churches, they asked me the question, do you believe in women elders? And I said, no, I don't. I have, I have ordained and worked with women elders and pastors. And then I said something that I don't think has ever been heard on the floor of a PCA presbytery then or since. I said, I repent. <laughs> Everybody kind of laughed, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, uh, you, you know, it's interesting. So you got you left the PC PCUSA and you went into the PCA, and the, the Presbytery basically confiscated all your property. Oh, yeah. So you lost your building, all of that. Uh, now, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, and listen, that was awful. It was so awful. I'm sure. And, and I closed my last sermon in that church. I mean, they kicked me and my family out of the manse, and we had to live above the bars downtown. Mm -hmm. We had offered them more than market rate for that manse. They had nobody ready to move in that manse. It was, I went from being on presbytery council to being verboten. But the last sermon of the last eight and a half, almost nine years I was there, I ended it with this. My text was from Hebrews, joyfully, they submitted to the, you've submitted to the confiscation of your property. And I quoted with a coat by Kierkegaard, above all, shun the priests, those men of long flowing garments, but as you shun them, make sure that you pay them whatever they ask, mm. because you wanna make sure that what is of eternal consequence to them, namely money, matters to you, not at all. Mm. But what is of eternal consequence to you is Jesus Christ. Mm. And those were my final words in those churches, and we left. And they changed the locks. Right, and you and you and then you rebuilt a new church elsewhere, I assume, in the PCA. Yes, uh, it's a little complicated, but I had an assistant, an associate, and in the next year, I moved to Bloomington. But yes, all the elders were strong, the money was strong, everything was strong, and that church still stands. Was this and is healthy? A, was this just a a particularly vindictive Presbytery? Um, but, you know, because even today, churches leave the PCUSA successfully with their buildings after paying essentially a breakup. I think there's almost like a list price of what you have to pay to get out now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Now, I don't I don't think they'll let you go to the PCA. I think it's like mm -hmm. no PCA, but you can go to ECO or the EPC. But I know it varies by Presbytery. Um, was did these guys just really were just like a bad, pre you know, really? Because like Highland, when Highland Park left the PCUSA, there are massive lawsuits and they had to pay like a $7 million breakup fee, and then they were allowed to leave, and they kind of just wanted to, I guess they just wanted to shake them down for some money. Well, yeah, if you ever saw Highland Park, you'd want to shake them down for money, too. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> My friend was the I, pastor. I've been to Highland. I, I've, I haven't been yeah. to the church, but I know Highland Park. Yeah. Like, well, it was very vindictive. You have to remember at that time, the Southern Presbyterian and the Northern had reunited back in 83. And there had been a stipulation that the Southern churches could leave the denomination in the next few years. Clayton Bell was a senior at Highland Park at that time. Clayton Bell fought like a dog to keep his church in the denomination. Um, there was a lot of tension back then. And the reason was that was the period of time known as the Justice Love Assemblies. And so that was the time when all the homosexuals were pushing to get the privilege of being elders and pastors. And so we left that year that they came into General Assembly, the study committee recommending that homosexuals be pastors and elders. And so it was very volatile, very volatile. And I don't know, um, you know, it was interesting. The guy that led the committee, the commission that tried to destroy our churches, um, <laughs> you know, Remember, I was on Presbytery Council. Mm -hmm. I had helped hire our executive presbyter, set up our offices in Richland Center. Um, and I mean, the minute we, and we let them know early, we did not hide anything. 
But the minute we let them know that given the commitment of the denomination to homosexuality, we could not continue. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it infuriated them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so again, I think this is an interesting story because again, talk is cheap. Uh, as they say, you know, talk is cheap. Whiskey costs money. And, you know, you know, you <laughs> and are so, beer for the horses, right? You've, you've uh, actually, you know, you, you talk about like, it's, it's easy to talk a good game of, you know, I count all things as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing mm -hmm. Christ, but you, you guys mm -hmm. like, actually were willing to pay a price mm -hmm. to leave. I mean, and that's like, and, and you did pay a price. You're like, look, you counted the cost. We said we we've left. Mm -hmm. And, and so you've, you, you've actually, you know, you, you took, you know, you paid a high price on that one. I think, it's, you know. I think you'll understand me when I say, I remember back in the gender neutral Bible controversy, skipping forward some years, I remember one day Wayne Grudem did not want CBMW to have a position against gender neutral Bibles. And we worked constantly. We were on the phone, him up at Ted's Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, me down in Bloomington. And I remember one day he said to me, you know, Tim, I don't think you understand what you're asking me to do. I'm here on the hallway of Trinity and I have colleagues on this hallway who are uh, egalitarian and who are uh, promoters of gender neutral Bible translation. And it is difficult. And I remember saying to Wayne, Wayne, listen, it is my father-in-law and my brother-in-law who are promoting gender neutral Bibles. <laughs> and when I go to family reunions, they are the ones that I'm fighting. And we love each other. So no, no, Wayne. No, I'm not cutting you slack. Now, I bring this up because you say you have skin in the game. This was my father. When he wrote publicly condemning Gothard, he flew down to Dallas Seminary to speak in chapel. It was a longstanding preaching engagement. He got picked up at the airport by a friend of us and said, Joe, we're sorry. We double scheduled chapel and you won't be preaching. And dad looked at him and said, dad, he said, you know, is that because of Bill Gothard? And the guy said, yes. Mm -hmm. And you look at Mr. Taylor. He had to start his own publishing company. He was director of Moody Press. Director. Okay. Mm -hmm. He had probably the highest selling children's book in the world at that time, the Bible and pictures for little eyes. But they would not allow him to publish living letters. And so he started his own publishing company. My dad wrote a satire about evangelicalism called The Gospel Blimp. It got turned into a movie by the same guy that did The Blob with Clint Eastwood. Um, my father and my father-in-law never started their reform at a distance with other people in other countries like apartheid. Mm -hmm. There is a principle in economics and community organization that is mostly known among Roman Catholics, and it's called subsidiarity. I believe that judgment should begin in the household of God, and I believe that the most appropriate authority is always the least centralized, the most local, and the most decentralized. And so, yeah, you have to prove your commitment to your flock you have to fight the wolf that's hmm. after them. If you don't have the integrity of a loving congregation that supports you and loves you, how on earth are you going to stay faithful? Like, you know, when you're flying on a, a jet that somebody has given you, like Bill Hybels over to Europe and you're alone with some good-looking broad. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No. Ministry has to be local. It has to be in a church. It has to be painfully uh, contextualized. You never get better than you are with your own sheep, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, it wasn't because anybody was seeking pain and suffering. You know, we didn't want them to confiscate the baptismal font made by Don Jared's father, you know, the banners that our children had made for Easter that year, the graveyards of our own that we already have a stone in with our name on. We didn't want mm -hmm. them to confiscate that stuff. But if it comes down to honoring God, I always tell people, because people will say to me, oh, Tim, you're brave. 
Okay. I remember John Piper once saying to me, Tim, where do you get your courage? And I looked at him and I said, well, first of all, from my dad. And he knew I was right because he knew dad. But I said, the other thing is, it isn't courage because courage and bravery never rise higher than the question of who, which direction you fear. And I said, all of us either fear man or God. You can't fear both. You cannot fear both. Mm -hmm. And so you have to fear God. Well, I think, you know, both of us uh, in different ways, you, you know, probably have a little genetic predispositions to being the way they are. <laughs> you, you, you point it there. And I, I talk about, um, uh, you know, the way I, I, I'm like, maybe I have a touch Asperger or something like that. Like, <laughs> you know, they, they hold up, you know, four fingers or whatever and say, you know, they're five, you say say five fingers, whatever it is. It's like, I can't, you know, I can't do that. I mean, like, uh, that's just not true. I, I, I can't tell, I can't say something that I just think is not actually accurate. Well, it's like, and it's like a physical, I almost think it's a defect. I think it's kind of a curse in a way. I would much rather be someone who could just very easily no. go along to get along and everything. No, be like that's, better. no, no, that's not true of you yeah. though. Yeah. I can remember the first lunch I had with you over at Mother Bears. Yeah. And it was such an encouragement to me because you said what you thought. Yeah. And so, no, I don't think it's true that you wish you were different because you go yeah. to bed to, at night with a conscience that has some aspiration to godliness, you know? Well, I certainly feel like, you know, there's like, oh, oh, you know, a responsibility that comes with certain things, you know, and um, so I have to, uh, you know, I have to say these things because I felt mm -hmm. other people weren't saying it. And in fact, I, I um, we'll get into CBMW here in a minute, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't even know who you were um, prior to starting The Masculinist. If I'd known, if I'd read your blog and I'd known people like Alistair Roberts and some of these other people when I started, I may not have ever done it. I mean, one of the main reasons I did it is like, I feel like I see these things that are off and I don't see anybody else talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd better do something. Mm -hmm. I better say something. And I'm very, I think it's Ezekiel where God tells Ezekiel, you know, if you see, if you see the king sinning and you call him out, then his, you know, his blood is on his own hands. But if you see it, you don't say anything, then it's yeah. on you. Yeah. So yeah. I guess always I say, I, as I'm to see something, say something. Got to see something, say something. I can't control what other people do, but I, but I at least have to say it. So how did you get involved with CBMW? CBMW, uh, I, Mary Lee and I got to be close to Kenton Barber Hughes. He was the pastor of the church where the president of Wheaton, the head of service master, the head of team, the head of uh, all kinds of Christian leaders, the, the president, the CEO of Crossway Lane, Dennis, Tyndale House, Mark Taylor, my brother-in-law, my father, they all went to college church. Kent was their pastor. And soon after CBMW started, Kent went on the council and became a council member. And Kent and I were close. And so I had watched their work and been very encouraged by it. And I moved to Bloomington to take a, 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 a church called Evangelical Community Church. Kent had actually, I was not looking for a position at the time. I was very happy in Partyville, but Kent recommended, they had lost a couple hundred members the two years before I was called. And they asked Kent who he would recommend. And I was one of the names that he recommended. So I ended up in Bloomington. When I was in Bloomington, I read, uh, I was a supporter of CBMW and I read um, an email well, uh, it may have been a mail. I don't remember. When. It would have been before uh, email. But I read an inquiry having to do with uh, Wayne, Wayne Grudem read, wrote a letter to all the supporters saying that he had raised money for the hiring of an executive director and they were looking for candidates. And that led to me writing them and saying I was willing to do that while serving as a senior pastor of Church of the Good Shepherd, which was the name of our church at that time. We had left ECC after four years. And so in October of 1996, the board hired me uh, to be CBMW's first executive director. Right, and you were, we were, only there, you were only there a brief period of time, is that? Is that yeah. I was there from October of 96 until June of 2000. So I okay, was there so for there four years. Yeah, yeah. You were, you were there a while. 
And, um, you know, complementarianism uh, seems to be a little bit cu kind of coming and glued um, today and that you have people dividing into different camps. And it, it was sort of like with, with Republican politics, you know, kind of this evangelical landscape, it's realigning. But if we go back then, uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious, you know, you know, your kind of perspective on the founding of that and kind of what it got right and what it got wrong, I think would be very interesting to hear. Because okay. I, I know a lot about the current of it, current, or current events, but back then I don't have any personal experience of what really went down there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of history. Um, back in uh, 1986, a group of people led by Piper, which included, uh, of course, Wayne Grudem, a guy named Wayne House, S. Lewis Johnson, some other people, Susan Foe, a woman. They decided that they needed to start a movement that was really a council confessing biblical faith at a place of heresy in the church. They wouldn't have called it heresy, but that's why they called it a council. And we know that councils historically, uh, the Roman Catholic Church says ecumenical councils are infallible. The first council of the church was the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. It was the first ecumenical council. And so their aspirations were to get a bunch of men together to declare that evangelical feminism was an error. And they had bad karma at the beginning, which, uh, which was them including women. It's not that the women weren't good, but the whole purpose of this was to guard the doctrine. And so they included women from the very beginning. And they were good women. That's not my point. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, then on 1987, at the meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, um, this was in Danvers, Massachusetts, just outside of Gordon-Conwell, where we lived. They held a meeting and they adopted what was later, uh, what came to be known as the Danvers Statement. Okay. They also, at that time, planned a book which came to become known and issued by Crossway a couple years later called Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which was really just a compilation of essays of, by different authors. Okay. And that was the origin. So that was in the late 80s. I came into CBMW in the late 90s. I came in 96, 97, 96, and left in mid 2000. So I came um, approximately 10 years after the first conception of CBMW. And CBMW had made sort of a name for itself. It was the competing organization with Christians for Biblical Equality. Christians for Biblical Equality was always dogged by homosexuality. I always had people, women splitting off from them, going into homosexuality. But they were the parallel to the Council on Biblical Manhood and Woman. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to keep going just a couple of minutes because I want people to get it fastened into their heads how this all went down. So I came into the organization in, in 96. In February of 97, I sent a letter to Marvin and Susan Alaska. He was the uh, editor-in-chief of World Magazine. Joel Belts was the publisher, and he was a good friend of mine. And I had talked to Joel, and I had said, listen, I have discovered that there is uh, a secret movement among the Committee on Bible Translation in Zondervan to neuter the NIV. At that time, the NIV was the largest, most used Bible other than the King James Version among evangelicalism. And I knew the man who announced that they were planning on doing it. He announced it in the publication of Christians for Biblical Equality. His name was Lars Dunberg. He used to work with Dad. I used to have dinner with him at Dad's table. Um, he had gone out to International Bible Society, and now he was the president of the International Bible Society, which owned the copyright to the New International Version, and which also paid the people on the Committee of Bible Translation, people like now Doug Moo, but then Gordon Fee, other people, to do revisions of the text of the NIV. And he announced in the Feminist Magazine that they were going to issue a neutered Bible. I then went to Joel. I said, Joel, this has to be announced. This has to be warned against. So Joel said, get in touch with Marvin and Susan Alaski. So in, Mar on March, uh, in, in February of 97, I sent a letter to Marvin and Susan outlining an article that should be done on that. 
in March 29, 1997, less than a month later, uh, they came out with uh, a cover story called the Stealth Bible. And it initiated. So world, and I think for people who don't know, World is a, a big time kind of, I think it's a bi weekly uh, magazine, you know, a very heavily Presbyterian focus. You know, Marvin Alasky's like a big name. This is like a big publication. This yeah. is the same publication that Julie Roy's blew up James McDonald in. They're still yeah. around today. Yeah. And they also have a very large Roman Catholic readership <laughs> subscription list. Um, but yes, and Marvin Lulaski at that time was a professor of journalism at UT Austin. Um, he later moved to New York City, but uh, this was World Magazine. And I had promoted World Magazine because my father was a hero of Joel Belts. And so that's how Joel and I, I have a, a lifetime free subscription to World Magazine. Mm -hmm. I still have it. Um, but they did this article. And let me tell you, evangelicalism blew to smithereens. It was international news. It was interviews on NPR. It absolutely blew CBMW completely. It just blew everything up. Evangelicals were livid. Uh, when you say blow up, do you, do you mean in terms of like made your name big or caused a big destruction in the organization? Well, I'm curious what you mean by blowing up CBMW. Well, it blew up the name of CBMW so that everybody knew it. Nobody knew okay. it beforehand. Our giving went through the roof immediately. This was just a few months after I came. I had no trouble raising money after that cover issue. And inside of a month or two, Jim Dobson called a meeting and he said, I'm going to go on the radio and I'm going to condemn the NIV and I'm going to condemn Wycliffe Bible translators unless you people agree you're not going to neuter the Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so within a couple of months, we had a meeting out in Huntington Beach at their headquarters. Okay. We had a meeting at Focus on the Family. The participants were Joel Belts, Wayne Grudem, John Piper, Vern Poitras, R.C. Sproul, myself. And on the other side was the CEO of Zondervan, Bruce Reiskamp. Uh, Ken Barker and Ron Youngblood, who were on the Committee on Bible Translation, and Lars Dunberg, who was the president of the International Bible Society. And out of that meeting came the guidelines for translation of gender-related language and scripture, which most people just simply know as Colorado Springs guidelines. Now, I tell you that because I become the executive director in December, no, in, in, in about October of 2000, 1996, February of 1997, I sent this letter to Marvin and Susan outlining the article, and you read the article, and it largely follows uh, the information I gave them. Then the Stealth Bible issue comes out on March 29, 1997. On May 27, 1997, is this meeting at Focus on the Family between the principal liberals and the principal conservatives. Colorado Springs guidelines come out of that. Zondervan promises that they will not we will not proceed. We're going to stop it, you know, which I didn't believe them in for a second. But all of evangelicalism was fighting. Everybody was fighting. Obviously, it had repercussions for the NIV. It had repercussions for Tyndale House and the New Living Translation, which had done largely the same thing. It had repercussions even down to the fact that in that meeting out at Colorado Springs, of Grudem, Piper, me, Poitras, Sproul, <coughs> and Joel Belts. We decided that night that there had to be a new Bible translation, okay? And then that summer, I went and met with my friend Lane Dennis, CEO of uh, Crossway, and brought a proposal from myself and Wayne that he try to work with Wayne to get copyright to the RSV. And that is what became the ESV. So the ESV came out of those meetings surrounding the Stealth Bible issue out in Colorado Springs. Crossway says that's not true, but they're deceiving people. I'm sorry to say that, but that's very important that all of this came in the space of a couple of months. And so when you talk about CBMW, I came in CBMW really believing in them, working hard, seeing God bless it with support. CBMW became known to everyone through it blew their name up. It was like uh, mm -hmm. it was like what's his face saying about Billy Graham, the L.A. Times, Puffin, 
Yeah. <coughs> so that's what happened. We got puffed. No, oh, well, that, you know, it's just one of those things, like, you never know when the lightning is going to strike and, and, and things are going to go up there. You know, when I think about that time, I know more politically what was kind of going on. Um, and, and I guess there's sort of a parallel in the church in that, you know, the 60s revolution really swept over the nation in the 70s. You know, divorce, mm -hmm. the sexual revolution sort of institutionalized itself. There was this big essentially leftward wave, uh, you, you know, in the culture. And in the 80s, you know, with, with Reagan, it sort of started to tilt back the other, the other direction. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, organizations we think of as sort of religious right came out of the new right movement in the in the 70s as sort of a response to this. Um, but, but it sounds like, I gather... I think there's a lot of people like to criticize CBMW as sort of compromisers today. Mm -hmm. But it does seem like there there was maybe a tight, kind of a feminist tidal wave sweeping mm -hmm. over the church. Mm -hmm. And they sort of said, we got to create some pushback on here. Mm -hmm. And rather than seeing them as maybe compromisers, I think people are saying they were soft on this, soft on that. But this really was an organization that kind of maybe was... Uh, you know, Piper had started his pastorate in Minneapolis in 83, I think. He was not a huge name, I don't think, back then. So these guys sort of like engaged in a maybe what would have been a, a uh, you know, kind of rebel alliance effort. It was, is that fair to say that they were sort of like a minority that were back on their heels trying to push against, you know, what seemed like an unstoppable wave coming? <laughs> or is no, that, no. That, that's what, that's what it sort of looks like. Okay. So let me, let me react to that. On the mm -hmm. one hand, I will tell you that I had great affection for those men because mm -hmm. of the battle they'd taken on because I was a repenting feminist. But on the other hand, let's be very clear here. These men consciously strategize to own the Evangelical Theological Society. They consciously strategized to control the presidency of the ETS. Wayne Grudem had far and away the best selling systematic theology in the world at the time. And he was making boatloads of money off it. So no, these men were mm -hmm. absolutely the leaders of evangelicalism at that time. They were not persecuted. They were not back on their heels. They were confident that they had protected God's truth. Wayne had produced this article on Kefale. Uh, they had John Piper, who was at that time very big, uh, and they controlled ETS. They controlled the presidency. Um, these men were extremely successful in publishing, in royalties, in mm -hmm. leadership, in the, in, in the positions they held at seminaries. I'm sorry, I know that you would like to be more sympathetic to them, but I came on thinking not that they were in any way poor, they were sitting in the catbird seat, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, Kent Hughes, the senior pastor of College Church, it was right across you know, the front lawn mm -hmm. of, of the campus of Wheaton. Now, let me say this. I came in thankful for their leadership and wanting to help them. That's why I came in. I didn't need a job. I had a full-time job. I had a young family. I was happy. But I wanted to help them because I felt such gratitude for them, okay? But this is what happened. I went to my first council meeting, and a guy named Dan Heimbach, who was from Wheaton, was a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary under Page Patterson, who was the president then at the time out in Southeastern, then he moved to Southwestern. Dan Heimbach had a military background, missions background, and he, he spoke up in the meeting and he said, I would like CBMW to take a position against women combatants in the military, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Aaron, you know very well that it seemed like a 16-inch softball lopped across the table of a bunch of men that had a bat and some women that had bats, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was appalled when immediately Wayne spoke up and said, no, we don't take any position on anything in secular society. We, no, we're not going to have anything to do with that. And I have to tell you, Aaron, that was the beginning of the end. I, let, I was still in that organization for four years. But all of a sudden I realized that what they wanted to do was only address the church in the home, the privacy 
of Christian homes and churches, and that they had no heart to teach the biblical doctrine of manhood and womanhood, except among evangelical Christians. And so, Aaron, I'm not interested in fighting and losing and being persecuted for the sake of, sake of a halfway compromise. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I know you wish I hadn't just said that, yeah. but it was so demoralizing to me. And it went on year after year after year, seeing them try not to address this issue, try not to address this issue, try to be silent here, whine about the fact that they were having to say no to gender neutral Bibles. Wayne had given a paper at the first ETS conference on how awful the neutering of the RSV was in the NRSV. Mm -hmm. And I went to him and I said, Wayne, what about the evangelical Bibles that are getting neutered? He didn't want to address that. And so you have to understand their desire to be uh, sort of uh, stem the tide in evangelicalism alone. That's what they were about. Mm -hmm. You know, when I read... Uh you know, I read the Danvers statement, I'm like, oh, you know, this looks like a pretty reasonable document. Mm -hmm. And I read, uh, you know, when I read uh, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, um, you know, one of the things that really, really did strike me about it is that these are, pe these are people who, you know, again, there's different positions. If, you know, somebody like John Piper, he is on record publicly as saying women should not be in combat. Yeah. Women should not be police officers. Yep. And he's taken, he's taken, he's taken some beatings over that. So Absolutely. There's some, there's some variations of opinion in there. But, 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 but one swallow does not a summer right. make. Yeah. Don Piper has always been the outlier. Right. And about every five years, he'll say something like that. And it blows up in yeah, his yeah, face. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so, but I, but I did get the sense of like, these guys are basically proof texting something here. It's like, if the Bible says, you know, there's a, a uh, there's a difference in in role between men and women. Well, then we have to stick to that. But wherever it doesn't speak explicitly, we can adopt essentially the egalitarian position. Yeah, that, that is pretty much what it how yeah, it reads yeah. when when I do it yeah, as a yeah, very yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, I am probably overly influenced in my interpretation of that by by Keller. Um, who was not part of that group, but you know he's he's one of the he's on the thinner side, as they say of it. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to me that they sort of um, they you know they sort of took this this uh, view that we're only going to talk about where we have I'll call them problematic texts. You know we we've got these texts they're here we have to believe what the Bible says so we have to stick on these points but these other points like about women in the military, you know, there's, there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, women can't be a soldier. There's nothing in the Bible that says this. And so we don't have to, we can just, you know, take a pass on that. We don't have to like, we don't have to affirm one way or the other. Yeah, I know, Aaron. It's so painful to talk about this because I had that conversation with Wayne time after time after time. I would say to him, Wayne, we have to address a theology of sexuality. It's not enough to have an, a precise, stingy view of the meaning of kephalae. Mm -hmm. You just, it, that's not going to satisfy my generation. It's just not. Mm -hmm. We see what's going on in families and marriages and in our society. We're becoming a matrilineal, a, a matriarchal, a, a feminist. And now, I, as I see it, having abandoned culture, we now have women making up the majority in almost every profession. We have women increasingly taking over the mayor, the mayoral spots of large cities. I mean, we just had another, the governor of the state of New York, and I'm not saying that Cuomo should have stayed in office, but my point is, it's, it's just this, and men are not interested in fighting with women. We're just mm -hmm. not interested. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the red pill mill, you've got MGTOW. And so I would say to Wayne, Wayne, we have to have a theology of sexuality. Mm -hmm. We have to say that this is God's plan. It was set up before the fall. It is good, okay? And Wayne would always say, Tim, the Bible is silent on anywhere but the church in the home. And I would say, no, Wayne, it's not. It says in Isaiah that God cursed his people by saying that children will be their oppressors and women will rule over them. Wayne and I must have had this exchange five to ten times. And every time I'd say that, he wouldn't answer. It would be the end of it. Now, listen, 
if I were Wayne and you think about how much people would have mocked him and despised him, he was getting smeared with not caring about domestic abuse. It was just a smear job. He, he Wayne took a lot of hits for the Lord. And I can see if I were in his position, just thinking to myself, well, I need to be reasonable because I need to go for the soft middle. That's who really is going to determine the future of evangelicalism. But my argument is, look at what we have. Right. Look at what we have. I told you. I remember talking to Wayne about usage. So I come from a publisher's family author. And so, you know, I grew up having my dad read cartoons from the New Yorker. You know, we had, I've always read the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling Wayne when he was making the case that there was still a legitimate place for using the word man as a, 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 a gender inclusive of male and female. And I said, Wayne, if you're going to argue based upon the fact that you found that being done a couple of times in the Chicago trip, remember the day is quickly coming that you will not find that done in the Chicago trip. And so you've established who you are and it's just a question of setting the price. Mm -hmm. And I just get tired of us as Christians not being willing to, to fight biblically, biblically taking a stand where we know God has revealed in his word. And the same thing has happened with homosexuality. We act as if now all we have to do is say, well, we don't believe in homosexual marriage. And, you know, we don't think body parts should be put together that God doesn't call us to. So then you look at the issue of effeminacy and it's Malachi in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And all these evangelicals, it's the same group of evangelicals. It's the people that think that they're so big and loud that they can't fail, okay? And they say, no, 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 no. We need to, we need to admit that homosexual orientation is a real deal. We need to join the fight against reparative therapy, whatever that is. And we are never going to win the hearts of young men and women by fighting halfway. We won't do it. And so I don't see, I don't see the benefit of us adopting. To me, what I ended up doing when I resigned from CBMW mm -hmm. is just saying, look, I know Hezekiah when I see him, okay? And he just wanted seven years of extra life. And I'm not interested in seven years of extra life. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. I do not want to be the idiot that's walking around dancing with a set of horns on his head saying, we're going to have victory. We're going to have victory. Mm -hmm. I want to be Micaiah. You know, I want to say the truth. And if I die for saying the truth, I'm convinced that that is more, uh, that's going to be blessed by God. I have never fallen on any sword without God blessing my willingness to fall. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds real hyper spiritual for you. You get uncomfortable with this kind of stuff, but I just think, come on, guys, let's lock arms and let's not decide that we're going to go for half half the loaf. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, it, it's obviously kind of not, you know, it hasn't really worked. I mean, if you look at it, you kind of look down the world. It really hasn't worked. I, mean, I see kind of complementarianism is it's kind of under siege from all directions mm -hmm. right now. And how do you see the future? I mean, where do you see? I mean, I, I wrote a piece where I kind of thought that, you know, I said complementarianism was really kind of built around the sensibilities of early cohort boomers mm -hmm. like Piper and Grudem. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's still a lot of them around in the churches, it's it's got like a natural base of support. Yeah, but they're gone. But they're cut over time. And, and as, as that kind yeah. of group of people passes on, it's not really going to speak to you know younger generations. So I mean, where do you where do you kind of see this evolving? What do you, I mean? You can make a general prognostication about evangelicalism, but where do you mm -hmm. think where do you think this is all going to go from a gender theology perspective? I've had friends who are missionaries to Africa, and they tell me that it is very common in the African sub-Saharan church that there are pastors and elders who have extended family members, uh, nieces and nephews living with them, okay? Mm -hmm. And that it's very, very common for Christian men who are ordained to the eldership and pastorate 
to abuse uh, their relatives sexually in their homes, mm. to abuse the wives of other elders, pastors. Um, and I bring that up because what has grieved me my whole life knowing missionaries is that missionaries simply have not taught biblical manhood and womanhood. They have not taught biblical. Instead, I remember Joel at World Magazine getting real involved in Covenant College in the movement to microfinance, okay? That was the big deal, you know? Microfinance mm -hmm. is what's going to take care of sub-Saharan Africa, right? Then you find out that microfinance loans are given, 95% of them are given to women. And well, that's, uh, that's basically why they exist. I mean, they're... They're yeah. explicitly targeted. It, you know. Yeah, but remember, at that time, evangelicals didn't know that we were going to all women. And I said to Joel, Joel, how is it helping for us to abandon the men to their lusts and to their pride and to their assault and battery? How does that help? Why can't we bring instruction and discipline into the church in Africa? Why can't we teach biblical sexuality? And there was nothing but silence. It just was not taught. And so what ended up happening is exactly what you would expect. And that is women took over all the positions of leadership and it's still happening in Africa. And we think it's a success and it's not a success. So you well, say- I think the perception would be that the African church is very conservative, very orthodox, and that it's the African church that's gonna save America. And you know, they're looking well, at the Methodists and all this stuff. Yeah, That, well, that it seems is. to be the standard issue talking point. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you, it is true that Africans are still conservative on the slaughter of the unborn. They're still conservative on homosexuality, on sodomy. And I've had African leaders in my church rebuking us as Americans mm -hmm. on those issues, okay? We had a Rwandan guy come into the pulpit and he said to us, he said, you people condemn us for the slaughter by machete of seven to 900,000 people. He said, you people kill more than that just in your country every year in the womb. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it is true that Africa has been resistant. In fact, you find that same thing among conservative African-American blacks in, in the United States, where a lot of them are the strongest people against homosexuality. And so to, to African-Americans in America, sexuality is not a tertiary or secondary issue because mm -hmm. they live under the oppression of the Buana black woman who absolutely, her power, her moral authority, her strength just suppresses black men in, in the American church. I don't know if I, I'm going off the reservation by saying that, but I talk about that with my African-American friends in our church. But let me say this, you know what I think about Trump? You mentioned okay. him earlier. I think Trump is what you get when you have Christians cower on the issue of sexuality. I think that's what mm. you get. I think that's where we're headed. I think we are going to have an increasingly hostile relationship between men and women pervasive in Western culture. And I think men are going to check out. They're going to get uh, motorized uh, uh, robotic sex objects. They're going to go deeply into pornography. Some of them will go into just having sex with like to like, which is male to male. Uh, the women find that, that it's much nicer cuddling with a woman and you can talk endlessly and, and she'll never go to sleep. She's still interested in what you're saying. And, and so we're going to have an increasingly harsh relationship between men and women. I don't have any question about that, okay? But it won't last. And it won't last because there has never been a matriarchy in the history of the world. Anthropologists who are honest will tell you that, okay? Men are actually different. And there will come a time when men will all become like Donald Trump. Whoa. Okay? I'm That's telling quite a you, bleak prediction. I'm telling you that is what's going to happen. I have no question about it. God can intervene. God can make a miracle like he did with the Iron Curtain. Nobody ever anywhere predicted that one. Mm -hmm. So God can reform. But separate from a miraculous change, it's going to degrade and devolve and debauch the relationships between men and women. Women are going to get more and more power, and the day's going to come 
when the men are just going to say, we're not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that's what's going to happen. And I think the only way to keep that from happening is for Christians to preach on sexuality. But we will not do that. Mm -hmm. We, we will not preach on sexuality. Well, that's a pretty bleak. Uh, that's a pretty bleak uh, prediction there. And uh, you know, again, a, a nation of Donald Trumps. That, that'll be our. Uh, that'll be our. Uh, that'll be our. Our men. We'll see how that. We'll see how that. Uh, you know, actually uh, goes. Hopefully, we'll we'll have a different change in direction. You know, I will. I kind of want to wrap up by uh, just giving one more thing. Is you had you had a big influence on on me. You know, when I kind of first met you. You know, again, I and you know, I didn't know about your, your stuff. And I kind of started to say that uh, we got together. I think you, you at, you know, you asked me well, what's your strategy. And, and at this time, I kind of thought, hey, you know, a lot of these these guys who are, um, you know, pushing this kind of like, you know, be a servant leader, and your wife will want to have sex with you stuff. But I really thought mm -hmm. probably a good chance a lot of these guys are kind of just, you know, they're naively wrong, and maybe we could reach them with the truth, and you know, maybe they'll go in a better direction. So I was, I'm gonna mm -hmm. try to reach, you know, reach reach the guys. And then I realize I come to realize you're like, well, that's what I've been doing for 30 years, and it hasn't made any traction. Mm -hmm. And I start reading through the old Bailey blogs, and I start going on. I say, like, these guys know. I mean, these guys know that these guys know the truth, right? Mm -hmm. There's no. These guys don't waste a minute trying to convince any of these big name pastors of anything because they, they they may believe what they're saying, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, but it's not like they've never heard the truth. They've never heard a Minority Report, mm -hmm. and so. I sort of said, well, really, if you want to make a change, we have to essentially, you know, you know, basically sort of discredit these people. But at the end of the day, I don't even need to, I don't need to spend any effort discrediting them because these guys are, you know, the ship has sailed on them. They're no longer really relevant. They're kind of in, they're kind of in retirement. They're no longer effective. There's generational changes occurring, mm -hmm. and so I think it's going to open up. It's going to open up new space. But it really did, it really did convince me. Trying to get to these guys and mm -hmm. convince them of anything is just a fool's errand. Don't mm -hmm. do it. Don't waste mm -hmm. any time hoping. Mm -hmm. Even if you got to them, they're probably just going to kind of massage you and keep you spinning your wheels for a very long time. And, uh, you know, so I'm like, I'm glad I didn't invest any more cycles in that strategy. Well, I remember meeting with you. I remember talking to you and I saw that you had one of the most sophisticated uh uh, understandings of the use and abuse of rhetoric I had ever run into in my life. Um, I remember you talking about the weaknesses of some of Tim Keller's things. And I mean, your simple observations were really profound. Now, I know people will think that I understand I'm supposed to flatter the host of a show. And I'm not interested in doing that. What I'm saying is true. And so I came away from that meeting thinking, okay, we've got Aaron. You look at a guy named Michael Foster. You look at uh, the whole Muscovite movement. You look at Jordan Peterson, okay? We have a number of men who are trying to get in, go directly to the young men and the young women who know things have gone to hell in a handbasket sexually, mm -hmm. okay? But let me just issue a caution. Mm -hmm. My whole life, I have watched men uh, try to fly and crash and burn. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go through the names. Bill Hybels is the most obvious one. That, you know, his church was just a few miles from where I grew up in Bartlett, mm -hmm. okay, Wayne. And we do not need men who are trying to make a name for themselves on social media. Now, you immediately, people are going to think, we well, just insulted your host. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. That is not Aaron. Aaron is a true believer. Aaron is unwilling to compromise the truth so that he can, like, get good stats on social media. He'll work like a dog to get good stats. Yeah. But that working like a dog is going to be solid content. And he's interesting. So I want to caution us. Yes, it's time to go directly to the young men and the young women. Good job. But do not listen to anybody that's an egotist. Do not listen to anybody that doesn't love Christ's church. Mm -hmm. Because the reform of the world is always preaching in the church. Yeah, I you know, I agree. And uh, I think that's good. And I, I, 
I think about that a lot because the the issue, uh, you know, the incentive structure of our world is designed to produce today social media stars. To be an influencer, you got to say and do the things that'll build you the audience. Uh, you know, a lot, like a lot of times you generate fake controversies in mm -hmm. order to draw. Because, you know, it's like on the, when two kids get in a fight on the playground, you know, everybody comes running to look at it. And so all, all these social media people strategically use conflict. They use all these things. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with marketing. I love marketing. But mm -hmm. all the incentives... All the incentives are essentially towards red meat, you know, all this stuff, you know, and that's like you see it in the political commentary and all, and it's, it's kind of sad. And, um, you know, I really don't want to, um, I really don't want to play that game, but, um, but I also don't want to, uh, sell myself short either. So it's, it's, it's a struggle and I, you know, I need to be reminded of that. And I'm, I'm, I've been listening to the Morris Hill podcast from Christianity today, like a lot of people. And I, I look at that and I say, I just got to just remind myself, let any man who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And that's, uh, you know, that's so important. I did have a, an audience question. Uh, so I want to get one audience question before before we wrap up here, which is from John. Where can complementarian <laughs> men find wives in increasingly egalitarian churches? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> do, you have any, do, you have any, do you have any thoughts on that one? Oh, I think it's priceless. Uh, here's my response. There is no such thing as a complementarian wife. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing. Was it Eve in the Garden of Eden? <laughs> no, I don't. In other words, listen, go to Monumental, the podcast at Warhorn, listen to my wife, talk about what she was like. The fact is, marriage is hard. Mm -hmm. Marriage is hard. And so you're never going to be able to find a woman who is already on board. She doesn't exist today. And if you think she does, you're in worse trouble because you're going to probably marry the daughter of a homeschooling mother who has taught her to wear dresses and to act as if she's in submission to her husband when hell no, she isn't. Right. <laughs> you know. And so what we have to do as men is realize how difficult it was to be Adam in the Garden of Eden, how difficult it was to be Priscilla's husband, Aquila, when she rebuked Apollos. In mm -hmm. other words, all through scripture, you have really difficult relationships. And out of those difficult relationships come beautiful works of God. Find a woman who loves you and then help her learn to submit to you. And you allow her to help you learn to love her. In other words, we have people getting married all the time in our church. There is no nirvana of finding women like this. You have to work at it. So the most important thing for the guy asking this question is for him to realize what he really needs to do is he needs to grow as a man, not as a Barney Fife, not as a larger than life iron pumper, but just grow as a man and find a wife that's willing for you to grow as a man and she's willing to grow as a woman. And, and that's what marriage is, you know, yeah, it's, Aaron, no, it's no nirvana for the women either trying to find no, a man, that's for sure. No. No, where, where do I find this mythical good man? Or I mean, how do how does your wife found you? Yeah. You know, does she tell you sometimes, you know, you talk a good talk on that podcast. Right. Here, right. You know? right. So, well, there you go. Well, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're on vacation. You still took time to join us. Uh, Tim Bailey, uh, the uh, senior pastor of the uh, Trinity Reformed Church in Bloomington, Indiana. For those of you who don't know, think think Madison, think Berkeley. It's sort of like that place in, in Indiana. And so he, he likes being in that environment. Uh, uh, so it's never a dull moment, I'm sure. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you, Aaron. It was wonderful to be with you.